I'm delighted now to welcome the Under Secretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment, Kathy Novelli. I think Kathy is a familiar figure to, uh, to many uh, here. You can read her full bio. She's been uh, at the State Department in this role since February. Um, she was at Apple before this, and most of us uh, <coughs> remember and know her as a um, longtime USTR um, official. She was assistant uh, USTR for Europe and the Mediterranean. Um, and involved in a lot of uh, uh, trade issues that are still uh, very much on the front burner today. So she's got a lot of great experience um, in economic statecraft. I also note that she spent some time at the London School of Economics, my alma mater, so delighted to hear that. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, spend the first 20 minutes or so um, uh, asking Kathy a few questions, and then I'll open it up to the audience, and uh, we'll use the same format of uh, identifying yourself and asking real questions. Um, so let me uh, start, Kathy. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome again. Thanks. By um, saying that you know you have an impossibly large portfolio, ranging from you know Chinese economic relations to oceans policy, and a lot in between. How do you prioritize all this, and how do you decide what's important to work on, um, and what do you think is important in, in what you do? Well, I think you know priorities are, uh, when I first came in, people said, what do you want to get done? And I had you know, three or four things that I knew I wanted to focus on, you know, uh, working on rules-based systems, so that's you know, all of our trade negotiations and bit negotiations, uh, and making sure those go forward. Uh, working on uh, intelligence about the internet. Uh, and when I say that, I mean really getting a much more multilateral, basic understanding of the value of the internet, which I think is missing. And so we're trying to negotiate all of these things without a kind of consensus that it's important to keep the internet clear, um, as well as working on the Secretary's Oceans Conference. and. Um, and as, as with everything, when you get involved, you find out that there's a whole lot of other things that, that have to be done. And I should say one of the other big pieces here was um, the fact that the Bureau was relatively recently formed. And so the question, which I know you've talked about, of you know, how to make sure that the State Department was uh, at least punching at its weight, if not above its weight, and how to integrate all these pieces, which actually all of them do have components that relate to each other, not always at every moment, but for example, on oceans, um, there's a huge economic component there. Um, on the peace process, there's a huge economic component. Uh, on environment, energy is critically important. So you know, you can't really do a good job of, uh, of forwarding anything without making sure that you've got all these pieces together. So even though the portfolio seems very, very large, it actually makes sense in terms of bringing these pieces together. Um, and in looking at, at kind of an overall frame of how do you decide what's important, um, Secretary Kerry has put forward, following on Secretary Clinton's economic straightcraft, put forward the idea of the shared prosperity agenda and that we need to be looking at how do we further things that are going to promote the prosperity of our colleagues and friends in other countries and our own prosperity and and what do we do and economics is obviously central to that but so are all these other pieces having a healthy environment having uh, energy that works uh, and is not contributing to climate change uh, and and economic development so so um, what I've been trying to do is focus on the places where all the intersections of these pieces come together and allow us to do things that are tangible, uh, tangible for us and tangible for, um, for our friends in, in other countries, um, because I think that just talking uh, is, is a good thing, uh, and it's good to have theories and underpinning, but results are better. So we're really looking at what can we do that are very results-based. And um, that means you have to kind of narrow down what you do because you can't do everything, or as one of my dear friends says, you can't boil the ocean. Um, and so, uh, for example, uh, we're just doing something new um, 
that we haven't ever done before at the African Leaders Summit, where we're trying to bring together various pieces and we're bringing uh, supply chain experts, so the ops people of major US companies, who are the ones who decide where are they gonna source inputs from, where are they gonna source manufacturing from, where are they gonna put um, their own presences. And we're bringing them to the table to say, here's the things we care about as big brands. You know, we care about all of the trade facilitation things that have been negotiated in theory, but here's what it means to us in practice. And this is why these things matter. We care about having strong <clears throat> environmental protection so our brands aren't harmed. We care about having uh, good labor policies and, and ability to hire workers and to, to dismiss them if they're not doing their job properly, but in an orderly way. Um, and, and so they're gonna list these kind of things that are their criteria. And then we, we have, of course, the African uh, ministers there to listen, and then we have AID there to also say, okay, well, where there's gaps in your country, how do we actually make these things happen in a practical way? Mm -hmm. um, so it sort of takes a layer below just the agreeing on the agreements, and what does that really mean in people's daily lives, and how do you use that to create jobs? So that's one example of trying to pull different pieces together of state's agenda um, and trying to work on development, prosperity, and also have tangible results. Okay, um, um, and I think this is, uh, raises a bunch of, of interesting uh, themes that I wanna come back to when we talk sort of more broadly about economic statecraft, but let, mm -hmm. let me go through a couple of substantive issues that are very much in the headlines sure. uh, today. One is obviously Russia and the mm -hmm. situation in Ukraine, which seems to go from bad to worse. Um, so the administration's announced a series of, of escalating uh, sanctions, uh, and uh, I guess the question is, what, what do we hope, what do we see as the end point? What do we hope to achieve um, through the use of sanctions, and, and how do we weigh the, uh, because many people you know, point out that, that uh, sanctions may or may not affect Russian behavior, but they do have an impact on us and a cost. Uh, for us in the short term and the long term. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do, we, how do we balance sanctions with other tools, including other economic tools, to try to uh, affect that situation? Well, uh, as we were talking about before, before we came out here in public, you know, sanctions are a tool that we have. They're not a perfect tool, um, but they're the tool we have. And I think when you balance them against the uh, using the military, they start to look like a better tool. Um, in terms of what we want as a result, I think what we want is for Russia to respect the sovereignty of Ukraine, uh, to not be interfering in that country militarily or otherwise. Um, and you know, we have uh, evidence that in fact they are interfering militarily. Uh, and uh, I think you're absolutely right that there's a cost to sanctions. One of the things that we've looked at when we've been trying to design you know, what to do is how do we have sanctions that are gonna have an impact? Admittedly, that impact may not be immediate, but that are directed at things that will matter to Russia for its both short-term and long-term interests. But also, how do we do this in a way that isn't going to shoot ourselves in the foot? And that involves making sure that we're not the only ones uh, taking sanctions. Because if we're, if we're saying, well, our companies or our banks can't take certain actions vis-a-vis -vis Russia, um, then we, we don't want a situation where our allies are sort of going into the breach saying, hey, you know, work with us instead. So we've been working assiduously with our European colleagues to, um, to make sure that they are uh, also on the same path we are, and I think you've seen the results of that work finally over the weekend. Um, and, and so we're trying to be very closely in lockstep with them, so, and also with our colleagues from Japan, so that we don't have this kind of situation where, uh, where, where other companies can benefit from this. But we want things to actually bite, and we've carefully chosen what we've done to date, and 
you know, obviously um, it's, it's nothing I can discuss in specifics here, but we're looking at if we have to do more, what would that be? And it's very carefully calibrated so that it's targeted and scalpel-like, affects as few U.S. companies as possible, but has the biggest impact as possible on Russia. Okay, uh, shifting to another part of the world that you were just in apparently last week, China. Mm -hmm. Um, so China's um, extraordinary economic success over the last three decades was uh, largely due to the fact that it was willing to open up and pull itself more deeply into the global rules-based um, system that you, dis you mentioned earlier. Um, yet recently, Beijing seems to be, uh, at least in some areas, more interested in going it alone, and uh, so it recently created a uh, uh, with its um, other emerging uh, partners, a BRICS bank. Mm. Uh, it's proposing an Asian infrastructure bank that it would um, that would potentially compete with the existing um, Asian Development Bank. Uh, you know, even the the environment for foreign investment in China has become noticeably less friendly. Uh, Microsoft's offices were were raided uh, overnight, apparently, and uh, there have been a lot of uh, similar uh, challenges. So. Uh, putting all this together, I wonder whether uh, China is uh, taking a new approach uh, from the approach it took the past 30 years and how we should respond. To, how should we should see that? Should we be concerned about that? Um, or is this something that, um, uh, that you know, is a natural part of their evolution? Well, I guess what I would say about China is at the same time that we hear about these things that are going on, and I don't want to minimize their significance, their importance, and the fact that, um, that playing by the rules and the international rules is absolutely key, and that we're going to hold China to the commitments that they made. Um, I also think there's a lot of things going on, and, and for me, um, Besides the formal meetings, I spent a lot of time informally talking to, to business folks, entrepreneurs, environmental activists while I was in China. And it was, it was very interesting to see how things are evolving there. Um, and so I think there's, there's a, um, well, there's certainly an appetite for concluding a bilateral investment treaty, which is quite amazing. Um, the first thing I worked on in my government career in the 80s was the US-China bit negotiations. And it, I have to say it was the most frustrating thing I was involved in for my entire career. So I was sort of pleasantly surprised coming back and seeing that um, the government is actually serious in China about that, which in a way is a counterweight to all the things that you said, because that is going to guarantee an open investment regime, a fair and level playing field, and give us and companies something to to kind of look back on and use uh, as a way to hold people's feet to the fire. So, so I think it's a mixed picture. I don't think it's all bad. I think, I think there's a mixed picture. Um, <clears throat> there's no doubt that China is asserting itself um, and it's, and it's uh, growth in the economy and it wants to assert itself politically and there's no doubt about that. And it's a big country and these are things that we are gonna have to deal with. I think one of the things we've said on the, the new Asia Development Bank is that for us, we think it's absolutely key that any bank that gets formed um, also have a rules-based, good governance um, kind of uh, way of proceeding. Uh, and I know that our, uh, our Asian counterparts in other countries that China has solicited also feel that way. And so I think there's a lot that can be done to um, kind of uh, make sure that as China spreads its wings, it's doing so in a way that is consonant with international rules. And I think that's something that we are going to have to keep in dialogue about. Um, I think that there is a lot of activity, particularly now on the anti-monopoly side, and that is a relatively new law for China. Um, we have heard some very negative reports about how it's being applied. It's something I raised um, with the NDRC when I was there. Um, I co-chaired a dialogue with them. This is one of the things we talked about is how can this be done in a transparent, fair way so that companies are not being just kind of uh, surprised by raids and uh, having prices being jawboned you know, by a government regulator. 
Um, one of the other things that I think that they're gonna have to deal with is how does their state-owned enterprise sector interact with all of this other economic activity? And are they gonna hold those companies to these same kinds of rules? What happens if they apply the anti-monopoly law to them? Um, and how is that all gonna work? And they, of course, are assuring us that that's what they're going to do, that everything's gonna be equal. But I think that's gonna have to remain to be seen how that plays out, and that's something that we're gonna have to be very, very vigilant about. But the other thing I would say that I thought was actually a very bright spot was um, meeting with a bunch of young tech entrepreneurs who have started up companies that are thriving without any government assistance. They don't want any government assistance. And I think that while this may not be a panacea for the short term, I do think that having more um, of this type of innovation occurring inside China illegitimately um, by uh, young Chinese entrepreneurs is going to be extremely helpful in our quest for better intellectual property enforcement because now there's going to be a vested interest in in you know having a really strong regime and we saw this with Israel where once they started developing a software industry they were one of the strongest in the world because it wasn't just somebody from the outside saying protect my stuff they're protecting their own so i think there is i think there's some reason to hope um, that things are going to get better that doesn't mean it, as that occurs that we don't have to still be vigilant mm -hmm. okay um, a lot of issues. Again, you have so much under your portfolio, it's hard to, to, uh, to, to, to go through everything. But let me ask about trade really quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, as a former trade negotiator, uh, this is a, a subject you know well, and particularly we have negotiations ongoing with the European Union and mm -hmm. the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership and mm -hmm. with our, uh, some of our Asian partners in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, but and both of these agreements are really critical to not only our global trade strategy, but also to our respective regional mm -hmm. strategies in those two parts of the world. Um, but both of these agreements seem to be facing some pretty significant headwinds, um, you know, both in the negotiating room and, frankly, in Congress. Uh, and so I guess the question is, what, what do you think uh, it will take to get these things done? And, um, you know, can we expect to see progress in the near future, especially on TPP, which, uh, you know, which seems kind of mission critical to what we're trying to do in Asia. Right, and, and I think it is mission critical, and I think having a very high standard agreement um, that, uh, that can be a, uh, a bar for others to look to is absolutely critical in Asia. We are making progress there, a great deal of progress. Um, and although it's not always in the headlines, you know, talks are going on on a, almost a continual basis. Um, so I feel confident that we're going to end up in a good place with a high level agreement um, that we can all say is gonna benefit our private sector. And I think um, the question of the Congress, you know, rightly, it's Congress's job to look out for U.S. economic interests. And so uh, Ambassador Froman has said, and I completely concur with this, that you know, the stronger agreement we bring back, the, the more uh, we're gonna be able to make headway with the Congress because there's gonna be constituents behind that agreement, both uh, you know, US companies, but also those who care about labor and environment and all the other issues that, that go into an economy. And, um, and that makes it easier for those in Congress who are concerned to actually move forward. So I think it is important to, to get the substance right in these agreements, and I think we're absolutely headed to do that for TPP. For TTIP, um, that's always uh, something that I thought was not gonna be concluded in a year. The relationship is so complicated, and what we're trying to do is another rung above, you know, garden variety kind of trade issues because we're looking at all these regulatory issues and those are very, very difficult. But again, I think that gives us a, a place to actually show what can be done, um, completely innovate in that area, 
And so um, we're going to have to live through the change that's going to happen um, in the European Commission, you know, their normal changing of the guard. And that slows things down a little bit. But I, I believe that we can get there on, on, uh, on TTIP as well. But it's not going to be between now and the end of the year. OK. Um, let me try to tie your energy and environment uh, portfolio together mm -hmm. by saying, as you did, uh, that they're interconnected. So the U.S. is going through this sort of revolution in our energy posture um, with the development of shale gas and, and, and new fuel sources. Um, so two-part question. First, what, what kind of leverage does this new posture give us in our foreign policy, or does it give us additional leverage because we're more, uh, more uh, self-dependent um, in, in, uh, in um, energy? And, uh, and secondly, on the other hand, since we're uh, still talking here about use of greater use of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, to what extent does this uh, revolution and new posture um, kind of complicate our efforts internationally to uh, advance uh, progress on curbing greenhouse gases mm -hmm. and and uh, and addressing climate change? Yeah. Well, those are excellent and very tough questions. Um, I don't know that we think about the revolution that we're having here on, on gas uh, as something that we use as a leverage. Um, and I certainly haven't seen that in the way that we've conducted our policy. Um, it certainly is something that has <clears throat> caused a lot of countries to press us uh, for greater exports um, because they want access to it. and they see that it is um, a cleaner fuel than coal, even though it's still carbon-based. And so uh, in terms of you know, the continuum of what's going to have less emissions um, and, affect, and affect our CO2, gas has less, uh, less effect. Um, so it's kind of, if you would say, going in the direction of, of helping on climate change, although it's not the same as wind or solar or, or other things. Um, so, so I don't know that I would say it, it's a leverage. I think it has become a point of demand for us. And part of what we have to do when we look at this is say, OK, well, what's in our own interest? And that's what the law requires us to do, too, um, because we now have access to very low-priced energy. And we don't want to be in a situation where if we export a whole bunch of it, that's going to cause you know, our domestic fuel prices to rise. On the other hand, um, if, we, if we are able to export it in a way that um, is consonant with our public interest, then that, that's a good thing. And it creates jobs here, and it helps, it helps with others. So I think that's the conundrum that we look at. Um, in terms of complicating our life on the, on the quest for you know, using renewables, Obviously, we are really pushing forward on the use of renewables, but we aren't going to be able to get from where we are today to 100% renewables in a short amount of time. So coal, gas, fossil fuels are going to be part of the mix um, even as we try to build out more use of renewables. And uh, folks are looking at how can we be more energy efficient in this, and we're working with other countries on this. Um, so that, and, and Ukraine's a good example, you know, they're very dependent on Russia for gas. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at with them is uh, can Europe produce some reverse flows for them, but also can they tighten up their energy efficiency so they have less demand? And so I think, I think there's lots of room for maneuver. And uh, the president has said that, you know, it's an all of the above strategy in terms of fuel that's used. And I think that's what we're, we're trying to do when we work with countries. Um, but we are trying to do what we can to make the playing field um, attractive to use more renewable energy. Okay, um, finally, before I open to the, the audience, um, again, there are a thousand other things I'd like to ask about, but let me just ask a question about Statecraft. So we did this report uh, mm -hmm. that I, I hope you had a chance to look at. Um, 
Uh, and um, you know, we tried to emphasize that, that Secretary Kerry has clearly emphasized the importance of economic statecraft um, or the shared prosperity agenda. Um, and he said in his, even in his confirmation hearings that foreign policy is economic mm -hmm. policy. Um, uh, sort of echoing uh, uh, Secretary Clinton's emphasis on this issue as well. So there, there's a lot of focus on this. Um, we were critical in the report of, of states' um, uh, uh, weaknesses in this area, although we also emphasized its strengths and its particularly its comparative advantage, as I was talking about in the previous uh, panel, with its reach uh, across uh, countries and across the world. Um, but from your perspective, having been on the job for a few months, what do you think are st state strengths and what do you think are the tools that you uh, need or, or can bring to the table to help advance um, our economic uh, diplomacy? Well, there's no doubt that states' reach is a huge strength that it has. I think states' people are another huge strength that it has. It has incredibly smart, dedicated people. Um, and I think part of what what we need to do is give them the running room to think creatively and to, um, and to mix in uh, and integrate more clearly how economics and politics actually are completely intertwined with each other. Um, and one of the things that I've done um, since being there besides really putting an emphasis on management as opposed to just looking at you know, running from this initiative to that initiative, but to get people working together and thinking together, is also to bring together the regional bureaus with, um, with all the folks in my house. So we meet bi-weekly um, to really brainstorm so that everyone knows what everyone else is doing, but also so folks can work together more clearly um, and integrate more clearly. And in fact, this whole um, initiative on Africa that I described is something that we came to together and is something um, where, you know, having been in the private sector, having worked very closely with uh, Apple supply chain folks, um, I know that the practical reality is sometimes slightly uh, different than the theoretical reality. So I had that to bring to the table, but we had all these other folks who could bring other pieces. And, and we're trying to do that more and more and more. And we did that also on Oceans, where we had a conference that was 90 countries um, that uh, I think most people feel was hugely successful beyond anything anybody could have thought. But the reason why that was is because we really integrated our regional bureaus together with uh, our environment folks and with our economic folks. And we worked together hand in glove on that for months and months to make sure that everything was in place for having things that were delivered, having the right people there, um, and, and then we're working together on all the follow-up too. So I think part of this is creating linkages um, that are gonna allow us to maximize our best self and our comparative advantage, which is being on the ground, but also having people who have that uh, broader focus. You know, they're not just looking at one narrow thing, and that sense of perspective, I think, is hugely important in any kind of discussion that goes on here from a policy perspective, too. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And uh, let me open it up to questions from the audience. I'm sure there are questions. So if you have one, please raise your hand, wait for the mic, and uh, please identify yourself and ask a question. Yes, sir. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. You had mentioned the internet as one of your focuses. Uh, can the internet be used for getting some of these things put together and getting the funding for them and having everything done transparently? Absolutely, and I'm really glad you asked that because one of the coolest things that I learned of when I first came to state is that somebody who was on my e-staff had uh, sort of risen to the challenge of trying to do innovative things and it created a system called BIDS, um, which is an internet-based system where you've got the state folks on the ground and the commerce folks working together who are inputting every opportunity for sales to government but also for partnering with companies into this database that can then be searchable by country or by subject matter 
by any U.S. company. And it not only has you know, what the opportunity is, but it has a contact person at the embassy who can then help guide you through. And so to me, that's a really classic thing of taking the information, and this is what the internet's great at, and, and being able to spread it out to more people in an easier way. Uh, and I think that's something that we need to do more of at State is beef up on the technology side. I mean, folks are not used to that. I am proud to say I'm the beta tester of, of an iPad. Um, but, but I think there's, there's many more of these kind of things where we can outreach to people uh, more clearly. Great. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Ken Meyer, Court World Docs. Uh, it's widely held that uh, the extremist groups in Syria and Iraq are being financed uh, by entities in the Persian Gulf. Does the fact that we haven't imposed any sanctions on states or individuals in the Gulf uh, mean that we don't see those groups as that big a threat or even that we support their objectives? No. I mean, obviously, we do not support the objectives of any extremist groups. Um, there are actually... Um, numerous rules that Treasury imposes on foreign assets control to deal with financing of groups. Um, and I think they're, they're quite robust in terms of what is our reach here in the US and how we can look at that. We also work um, through Interpol and others on, on terrorist financing. So that is a huge focus of the administration. Um, and there's lots and lots of, of energy being put to do that. Um, I don't think, I guess what I would say is I don't think that classic sanctions are the way to always deal with every single thing, the kind of sanctions that were work that we have in place with Iran or, or with Russia. Um, and I think what we're doing is appropriate in terms of trying to get at the money. Okay, uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, Dana Marshall with Transnational Strategy Group. It's very nice to see you again, Kathy, after a long time. And I want to sort of take you back to the future. One of the first things we worked on is what has now become a wildly successful program, the QIZ program mm -hmm. in Egypt. I think many of us know how successful that's been, even under the toughest times there. My question, though, is looking at the future. Obviously, again, dramatic developments in Egypt. Charlie Rifkin spoke recently at the U.S. Chamber a bit on that. I was going to see if I could draw you out a bit about what uh, might you guys be cooking up that you could share with us to try to support some of what CC is doing there in uh, economic reform, building up business, and generally trying to kind of support what they're doing in Egypt. Well, um, there's, a, there's a huge, um, and there will be a continuing aid budget to try to support um, both creating the infrastructure that you need for um, business to operate efficiently, and this goes to things like trade facilitation and how do you register your business, et cetera, as well as how do we support more innovation, entrepreneurship, you know, going on in that economy. Um, and I think, you know, getting more indigenous innovation is going to be key because that's going to also help derive efficiencies in the system. And I think, I think there's a really a limit to what you can impose from the outside. So some of it folks have to understand um, is coming internally because it's going to actually help people in your, in your own economy. Um, one of the other things that we're really looking at is as folks are putting regulatory systems in place, how can they make sure that the private sector has input into what's the outcome of any regulations that are going to happen. Because to me, and, and this comes from my private sector experience, even the most well-intentioned government officials um, don't really understand like what's the nuts and bolts that businesses do. And I think you need both sides of it. You need the people who are worrying about public policy, but you also need, well, okay, if you want to get from point A to point B, what's going to be the most effective way? And I think that kind of work with Egypt is going to be very important as, as they move forward and try to build something that is less bureaucratic and more, um, more geared towards making it easier for businesses to operate. 
Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Richard Feinberg, University of California in Brookings. Uh, let me take you to the Western Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. uh, two interrelated questions. You spoke of uh, Chinese assertiveness. Uh, there is a potential project uh, for a second uh, interoceanic canal to be built through Nicaragua uh, by the Chinese. Uh, does the U.S. government have a position on the desirability of such a canal? Have we spoken to the Chinese at all about the project? And then second question. Uh, the Summit of the Americas is an important uh, multilateral forum for the United States uh, to demonstrate our leadership in the hemisphere. Uh, all of the Latin Americans have said that at the next uh, impending summit in Panama in this coming spring, that they will not attend if Cuba is not invited. Uh, is the United States, in order to salvage this uh, a leadership forum for us, are we prepared to go along with the Latin American consensus on uh, a Cuban presence? Well. Um this is where I can say happily that I, you know, am working on economic issues and not political ones. Uh, um, obviously, our policy with Cuba is going to be uh, what our policy with Cuba is, and um, I, uh, we will be working to make the Summit of America a success, but make it also consistent with our policy with respect to Cuba. Um, in terms of the canal, I honestly, I don't know whether we've spoken to the, the Chinese or not. It's not something that I've been working on personally. Okay, yes ma'am. Hi, Abby Pratt with the Advanced Medical Technology Association. Mm -hmm. um, could we just turn back to Russia for a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate your comments about trying to target sanctions or at least think about sanctions in a way that doesn't disadvantage U.S. industry. There is another aspect of sanctions, and that's the fall, some fallout from that, is that the Russian government wants to be more self-sufficient. They've wanted to do this for a while economically, mm -hmm. but I think it's speeding up the process, mm -hmm. um, leading to more forced localization or local content requirements. Could you talk a little bit about whether this issue is on your radar and what you might be doing to address it? Well, the issue of forced localization is absolutely on our radar, not just with respect to Russia. Um, and, uh, you know, if you want to have any kind of a modern economy, um, forced localization just, it doesn't work. And I think you can see that in spades with Brazil um, in, in its whole information technology sector where there were, you know, what, what is produced there is not the most modern uh, products because of the way in which they, they have their requirements. And I think, um, so part of this is there's lots of examples about how that doesn't work for your own economy and we are now in a global supply chain and a global economy. Um, in terms of Russia, uh, you know, we, we obviously we cannot control what the Russians do and um, while we certainly are and do discuss issues with Russia, um, the, the major kind of dialogues like we had, have and have with China um, are not at this moment, you know, in the most robust form because we are um, having these difficulties with each other. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't um, both talk directly about this, but also um, work with, with other countries who are like-minded with us to also put pressure um, on this because I think forced localization is just a, a terrible idea across the board, not just for manufacturing, it for, um, for having data centers that have to be located for all of those kind of things. Um, we are, it is on our radar and we are vigilantly, you know, fighting against it. Okay, Sean? Thank you, Sean Donnelly from the U.S. Council for International Business. Um, Kathy, could you just talk a little more about how it's working with the regional bureaus at the State Department and getting them involved in this. I think it's a key point in the, uh, in the, in the report that uh, CSIS has, has put together and any other sort of reactions you had to the, the report. Thanks. Um, well, <laughs> uh, just in terms of the regional bureaus, like I said, we, we get together um, bi-weekly with the, uh, the economic DASs uh, everybody talks about what they're doing. Um, my, my personal team is organized um, so that there's liaisons with each 
uh, each regional bureau. Uh, and I, I do feel like we're working pretty well um, and that, the, uh, you know, by nature it's a matrix situation. And I think the goal is that uh, everything economic that happens, we're touching it, we're driving it, um, and that it's not in a stovepipe manner. That, and the more that, that uh, we have successes doing that, the, the easier it is to work there. Um, and I think we've developed some very, very good working relationships um, that have driven very specific things. So um, I, you know, I read the whole report. Uh, and I think, um, I think there's a lot of food for thought there. I also think that some of the things uh, that are noted in there are things that even not reading the report, I had already been on top of and trying to address, and I do feel like we're making a great deal of progress. I think our relationships in our agency are excellent, um, and I have felt no, uh, no issues there at all. Um, and, um, and I, you know, I'm just looking forward to continuing that and growing it. And like I said, I think the more we can accomplish, the easier it is for, for that kind of integration to occur. And that's partly why I'm focusing on tangible things and just partly because I think tangible things are important. I would note that we did, um, one of our top recommendations was that the, uh, the E undersecretary should, uh, should be the sort of the central organizing uh, principle for economic statecraft in the central. Uh, center point. So, uh, so that recommendation, I hope uh, you agree with. Totally. Um, uh, okay, let's take maybe one, or if there are two more questions. Yes, ma'am, and, and then we'll take the lady back there, and then we'll wind it up. Thank you. My name is Julian, the visiting fellow of, of CSIS. Uh, uh, I have a question about China. Um, uh, recently, Chinese top leaders are very active in foreign affairs, I think. Uh, the result of that made many, uh, several uh, big deals with other countries. For example, the, the, the gas from Rush, Russia, the, the LNG from England, and uh, some uh, FTA from uh, Korea and uh, the, the UV standard of, with German. So um, even Chinese market may be going bigger, but um, if uh, the, the, the trade neg negotiation or the bid negotiation with China don't have some big significant progress, I think maybe the potential share of US company in China will be decline. How do you think about this situation? Thank you. Okay, okay. shall we just take the other one and then sure. we'll do them together? Sure. Go ahead. Good morning. Uh, Megan Tremarch, USDA Foreign Agricultural Service. Uh, every so often we hear in the hallways the whispers of a combined trade agency, and I just wanted to see if you had any thoughts on that. A combined trade agency. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, on that, I think um, I, I, that's not something I would personally think is a very good idea. I, I think that um, it is important for USTR to be uh, very flexible and lean. And uh, so, I, you know, I would be very worried about uh, folding them into a larger, a larger agency. That's just my personal view. Um, on China, I, I think what I would say is. I think it's fantastic that China is engaging with the other countries, that they are working on these agreements, that they are more integrated, and, and I, I hope that that continues. And I think U.S. companies can compete in a global environment, um, and I have no doubt that they will, and so many U.S. companies are uh, multilateral in any event. Um, and so I think the more integrated China is, the better for everybody. Um, and so I, I welcome all of that activity. Okay, terrific. Um, really fantastic tour de force, Kathy, and, <laughs> and you covered a lot of ground and, and answered very, uh, uh, with great insight and clarity, and we really appreciate that. Sure. And, and your just presence here is, is really um, an honor and very helpful to us in terms of our trying to get uh, the story about economic statecraft out, out. So we appreciate that. Um, I'm glad you read the report. I hope you all and your colleagues uh, see it as a, you know, constructive contribution to what you're trying to do because we're certainly trying to 
um, help you. I'm a treasury guy originally who has a little chip implanted in the back of my brain that, you know, treasury does international economics and others kind of can follow along if they're, if they're interested. But, but I must say as a citizen, uh, you know, I think it's really important for, uh, for our foreign ministry to be uh, good at economics and to know uh, why it's important and to know how to use it in practical ways to advance our, uh, our national security and our foreign policy. And so uh, that's what we're trying to do here is to help uh, shine light on, on that important issue and to provide hopefully some constructive suggestions for um, how to, uh, to help state do this better. Right. So I uh, really appreciate your coming. Uh, Please join pleasure. me in thanking Undersecretary Novella. Thank you.